Ever wondered how banks across the globe ensure they have enough capital to cover their risks? In today's financial world, this is a question of paramount importance, and the answer lies within a set of banking regulations known as the Basel Accords. The Basel Accords, named after the city of Basel in Switzerland where they were developed, are a series of three progressive regulatory standards, Basel I, Basel II, and Basel III. These standards are put forth by the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, or BCBS. This committee is a global group of banking authorities who work together to provide a forum for regular cooperation on banking supervisory matters. The primary goal of the Basel Accords is to ensure that financial institutions around the world maintain enough capital to meet their obligations, even in the event of a financial crisis. By setting minimum capital standards, the Accords aim to reduce the risk that banks will become insolvent if they suffer significant losses. But it's not just about preventing bank failure. The Basel Accords also have a broader objective, to enhance financial stability worldwide. The Accords aim to make the international banking system more resilient and less prone to crises that can have damaging effects on the global economy. In essence, the Basel Accords provide a framework for banking supervision that is designed to promote the stability of the financial system. They do this by setting out detailed standards for how much capital banks need to hold, how they should manage their risks, and how they should operate in a transparent and accountable way. The Basel Accords are not a one-size-fits-all solution, instead they provide a flexible framework that can be adapted to the specific circumstances of individual countries and banks. This flexibility is crucial in a global banking system where financial institutions vary widely in size, complexity, and risk profile. Now that you understand the purpose of the Basel Accords, let's delve into the first accord, Basel I. This is where the journey of global banking supervision really began, setting the stage for a new era of financial stability. The story of the Basel Accords is a story of evolution, response, and key takeaways that continue to shape the world of finance today. In 1988, the first Basel Accord, known as Basel I, was introduced. This global regulatory framework was developed by the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, with the aim of promoting stability in the international banking system. Basel I was the first attempt to establish a set of minimum capital requirements for banks, which, in essence, is a safety net, a buffer of sorts, to protect against potential losses. One of the key tenets of Basel I was the requirement for banks to hold capital equal to 8% of their risk-weighted assets. The idea was to ensure that banks had enough capital on hand to absorb a reasonable level of losses before becoming insolvent. It was a way to mitigate the risk of a bank failure, which could have severe economic implications. However, while the principle of requiring banks to hold a certain amount of capital was sound, Basel I was not without its criticisms. The main point of contention was its simplicity. Basel I used a fairly basic method to calculate risk-weighted assets, dividing them into different categories based on the type of asset. For instance, government bonds were considered risk-free, while corporate bonds were deemed risky. This simplicity was both a strength and a weakness. On one hand, it made the rules easy to understand and implement. On the other hand, it was seen as too simplistic, failing to accurately reflect the riskiness of different types of assets. It did not take into account the creditworthiness of the borrower or the likelihood of default. This meant that a loan to a financially stable corporation was treated the same as a loan to a struggling company, despite the obvious differences in risk. Another criticism was that Basel I did not consider off-balance sheet exposures, which could also pose significant risks. It was a one-size-fits-all approach which did not adequately capture the complexity and diversity of banking activities. While Basel I was a step in the right direction, it had its shortcomings, leading to the development of Basel II. In 2004, Basel II was introduced to address the shortcomings of Basel I. This heralded a new era in global banking regulations, an era where risk management was to be at the forefront. Basel II was built on a three-pillar structure. The first pillar, minimum capital requirements, sought to ensure that banks held enough capital to cover unexpected losses. The idea was simple. If a bank lent money, it needed to have a safety net in place just in case. But unlike Basel I, which had a one-size-fits-all approach, Basel II allowed for more flexibility. Banks could use their own internal models to calculate the capital they needed to hold, reflecting the specific risks they faced. The second pillar, supervisory review, 
underscored the importance of oversight. This pillar emphasized the need for banks and regulators to work together to ensure that banks were not only meeting the minimum capital requirements, but also managing their risks effectively. Supervisors were encouraged to review and assess banks' internal capital adequacy procedures and strategies, promoting a culture of continuous improvement in risk management. Then came the third pillar, market discipline. This was all about transparency. Banks were required to disclose information about their risk profiles, capital adequacy, and risk management strategies. The idea was that market participants armed with this information would be better positioned to assess the soundness of banks. This in turn would encourage banks to maintain strong capital positions and risk management practices. The goal of Basel II was to better align regulatory capital requirements with the underlying risks in the banking sector. It aimed to strike a balance between financial stability and economic growth, and for a time it seemed to be working. But the financial crisis of 2008 exposed weaknesses in Basel II necessitating further refinements. While Basel II was a significant step forward, it became clear that it wasn't enough. The world needed a new approach, one that would better safeguard the global financial system against future crises. In response to the financial crisis, Basel III was introduced in 2010. The financial world was still reeling from the fallout, and the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision knew they had to step up their game. They needed a more robust framework that could withstand financial shocks and protect the real economy from the ripple effects of the banking sector. Enter Basel III, a set of reforms that took a more comprehensive approach to risk management. Let's break down the key changes that were brought in with this new accord. Firstly, Basel III introduced higher capital requirements. Banks were now required to hold more capital, specifically top quality capital, to absorb losses. This was like a safety net designed to catch banks before they hit rock bottom. The minimum requirement for common equity, the highest form of loss-absorbing capital, was raised from 2% to 4.5% of total risk-weighted assets. Secondly, Basel III introduced a new leverage ratio. This was a non-risk-based measure that aimed to restrict the buildup of leverage in the banking sector. It was a backstop to the risk-based capital ratios, ensuring that banks couldn't take on excessive debt. And thirdly, Basel III brought in liquidity requirements. This was a game-changer. For the first time, banks were required to hold enough liquid assets to cover their total net cash outflows over a 30-day period. This was known as the Liquidity Coverage Ratio, or LCR. There was also the Net Stable Funding Ratio, or NSFR, which aimed to promote more medium and long-term funding of the assets and activities of banks. The goal of all these changes, to bolster the banking sector's ability to absorb shocks, whether from financial or economic stress, and reduce the risk of spillover into the real economy. No doubt, Basel III represented a significant step forward in global banking regulation. It aimed to make the banking system safer, more resilient, and less likely to cause harm to the real economy. Basel III represents the most recent evolution in global banking regulation, but the story is not over. The financial world is ever-evolving, and so too must our approach to regulation. So, what have we learned about the Basel Accords? Well, let's take a moment to summarize the key points. Starting with Basel I, the original intent was a simple yet revolutionary idea to create a global standard for banking regulations, a benchmark for minimum capital requirements. This was a response to the banking crises of the late 20th century, aiming to mitigate the risks associated with financial institutions and to promote a more stable global banking environment. Then came Basel II, which introduced a more nuanced approach, acknowledging that not all banks and not all risks are equal. It incorporated the concept of risk-weighted assets, allowing banks to hold different amounts of capital depending on the level of risk they were exposed to. It was a significant step forward, adding a layer of complexity but also of realism to the regulatory framework. Yet, the global financial crisis of 2008 revealed that Basel II, while more sophisticated, was still not enough. It was then that Basel III was introduced, bringing us to the present day. Basel III is the most comprehensive of the Accords so far, incorporating not only the lessons learned from its predecessors, but also introducing new measures to promote financial stability. It emphasizes the quality of capital held by banks, introduces a global liquidity standard, and enhances the framework for dealing with systemic risk. It is a testament to the ongoing evolution and refinement of banking regulation.
The Basel Accords have played a pivotal role in shaping the global financial landscape, promoting stability, and reducing the likelihood of future financial crises. They represent collective learning, an ongoing dialogue between regulators, banks, and other stakeholders to ensure that the global banking system is robust, resilient, and capable of weathering financial storms. While the Basel Accords have evolved over time, their core objective remains the same, to ensure the stability of the global financial system. Stay tuned for more insights on the world of finance. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and comment. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell to keep up with the latest content.